Hi guys, I hope you're doing well and welcome back to another video where today is a really exciting day because we have finally finished off all our videos on the topic of Hitler and Nazi Germany and we're going to be moving on today to our next dictator that we're going to be talking about which is of course Mussolini and fascist Italy. And again guys, we're going to be following the same structure of videos that we did for Hitler because it is the structure that the IP syllabus asks us to follow. And what is this structure exactly? Well, we're going to start off discussing Mussolini's rise, the causes for his rise, the reasons why he rose and so on then we're going to be moving on to the ways that he consolidated and maintained power and finally we're going to be closing off with his policies both domestic policies which are economic social policies cultural policies and the foreign policy of italy as well because um, those are also important that we discuss for paper one so without further ado let's get started with the video because today even though it's our first video we already have a lot to talk about and a lot to unpack given that Mussolini's rise is a bit longer than Hitler's actually and there's a lot to unfold there so let's get started so guys if you recall back to our first couple of videos on Hitler's rise to power you'll remember that we actually started off discussing Hitler's rise by talking about Germany prior to Hitler more specifically the Weimar Republic which was this period of liberal policies and a democratic government that very much preceded the very uh, authoritarian and conservative uh, period of the Kaiser and preceded Nazi Germany under Hitler. And you will see that in just a second when we start discussing uh, Mussolini's rise to power, we're not going to dive into Mussolini's political career, for example. And we're going to backtrack quite a while, actually, and start off discussing uh, liberal Italy, which was, again, this period that came before uh, fascist Italy, but after the unification of Italy in 1871. And basically, guys, we have to talk about liberal Italy because a lot of the reasons as to why Mussolini managed to grow to become this uh, great dictator in Italy and fashion to become this massive ideology origin to the liberal time. In our next couple of videos, we're going to be discussing the weaknesses of liberal Italy essentially by breaking them down into two main categories, the long-term weaknesses or the long-term causes to the rise of fascism and the short-term causes or the short-term weaknesses um, to liberal Italy as well. In this video in specific, we're going to be starting with the long-term causes. Uh, and finally, guys, just one last piece of clarification before we dive into the content of this video. Again, I'm really sorry I'm stretching this introduction out for too long, but uh, we simply have to make these clarifications and distinctions very clear because otherwise it can be very confusing when we discuss this topic. So the more we break it down, the further. Uh, but back to the clarification that I want to make. Uh, you will see that the terms short term and long term are often used very differently by different historians uh, when they study various different fields. And they're actually very loose terms that often mean different things depending on the historian you ask. So just to illustrate, for example, when we talk about the long-term causes of World War I, uh, some historians might deem that as uh, years prior to World War I in the 19th or even 18th century, whereas others might just view the long-term causes as only a couple of years prior to the eruption of conflicts in 1914. Uh, similarly, when we talk about the short-term causes, that could be interpreted as only months prior to a conflict, only days prior to a conflict, or even two, three, four years prior to a conflict as well. So it depends a lot on who you ask, what they will consider long-term and short-term causes. For the sake of clarification, again, I want to make it very clear that in this video, we're going to be taking the long-term causes to be uh, all of the weaknesses of liberal Italy from the Italian unification of 1871 all the way until the beginning of war in 1914 and for Italy in 1915 with the Treaty of London. Alright guys, so that summarizes the introduction of the vi this video, all the clarifications that I wanted to make. If you're still confused on why I chose these dates for long-term causes and short-term causes, or if just these concepts are kind of confusing still, please, please ask me questions down below or email me or DM me because uh, I know a lot of people struggle to uh, wrap these ideas around their heads, but I hope I've made it somewhat clear. So without further ado, let's get started by discussing the long-term weaknesses of liberal Italy, which are also the long-term causes for the rise of fascism in Italy. All right, guys, so the first major weakness of liberal Italy was the lack of an Italian identity. Um, so let's take a look at exactly what this was and why it was a major weakness. Historically, guys, even prior to Italy becoming a single country, it was very politically divided, possessing different regions, kingdoms, and so on, with each of them having their own little people of sorts. 
which is why when the Italian unification took place in 1871 and these people were all conglomerated into a single nation, uh, pretty much everyone had a diff diff very difficult time in accepting the notion of uh, the Italian nation, of the Italian identity. Besides the fact that very few Italians were involved in the unification of Italy in 1871, in a concept known as regionalism, people were actually much more faithful and saw much of their identity in their families or immediate regions than in the concept of an entire country, which is something very difficult for us to grasp nowadays because uh, we ourselves see um, our own identity part in our nationality. So you can be American, Russian, Brazilian, Italian, British, and so on. But at that time, this was not a common thing for the people of Italy, who saw themselves much more in the regions that they were around, rather in this idea of the single Italian country. And also, this cultural barrier that was already put in place by regionalism grew even taller as communication was also very difficult in Italy at that time, given that only around 2% uh, of the population actually spoke Italian, with the other 98% speaking a variety of different dialects that were very distinct to specific regions. And as you can see, all these factors greatly hindered the building of an Italian identity and thereby of the Italian nation, as there was uh, in, uh, effectively no united Italian people, or if there was, it was only by name, something that would greatly hinder the development of Italy in the next couple of years on a social and economic basis as well, as there was no united people to move the nation forward. Alright guys, but if you thought that this factor was very limiting to the longevity of liberal Italy, wait until you hear this next one, which was a direct threat to its survival. And of course, I'm, just, I'm referring to the general hostility that the Catholic Church had to the Italian state. As you know, the Catholic Church has always been very powerful in Italian society with many Italians nowadays still believing uh, themselves to be Catholics, and most, if not all of the Italian population back then, also followed the Catholic doctrine. Which is why you can see that it would be a great threat to Italy's survival if the Italian country was at odds with the Catholic Church. And this is exactly what happened. And this was merely because when Italy was created, it seized the Papal States and Rome from the Catholic Church, something that the Church naturally resented as these were very valuable regions for the Catholic Church and many of them also considered to be holy regions as well. And this event actually led to a long-standing period of hostilities and tensions between the Italian state and the Catholic Church. The Pope banned Catholic uh, representation and participation in the Italian general elections as an attempt to boycott the Italian state and its political system. Them, something that would only end in 1895 with the rise of socialism, which was a greater threat to Catholicism than Italy was. Alright guys, but moving on to our next factor that we're going to be discussing, let's talk about some of the major economic weakness of liberal Italy, which were many to be very honest. All in all, because Italy was a very new nation, its economy was very primitive in many ways. Besides being an agrarian economy that uh, basically means that it depended a lot on the agricultural sector, the majority of Italy's population around 68% were actually farmers or peasants that lived in very uh, harsh conditions, often extreme poverty, uh, very much depending on their immediate crops to survive as they ate what they grew. Besides that, Italian industry was also very underdeveloped with the few industry that there was actually being uh, small enterprises that were very craftsmanship uh, based. And the main reason for this was because Italy lacked a lot of natural resources and raw materials as well, uh, primarily uh, coal and and iron or steel, which made it very difficult for the development of the heavy industry sector of the economy. If you've done economics or if you've actually watched some of our last videos on the Nazi economic policies, you will know that heavy industry is like the groundwork for the building of a strong and robust industrial or manufacturing power, which is why it was very difficult for Italy to build up its industry and its manufacturing given that its heavy industry could not be developed. And actually, the very few industrial development that took place in Italy was mainly directed towards wartime industries and military purposes, given that the few raw materials that there were in Italy, such as iron, coal, and steel, were given to industries such as shipbuilding or the building of ammunition as well. And also, most if not all of these were concentrated in the north of the country, where the majority of the transportation links actually were, such as the railway networks for example. And this in itself actually led to another major 
weakness that we're going to be discussing later on, which is the development of mass inequality in the country. Given that the majority, if not all, of the industry was concentrated in the north, what actually ended up happening over time was this cultivation of the rich north and the poor south, as the north continued to develop uh, exponentially in its, mili in its military industry, um, industry in general and manufacturing as well, would the south remain a very agrarian part of the country where people still live in extreme poverty. All right, guys, so this wraps up the economic weakness of liberal Italy. So now let's talk about the political weaknesses as well, because in my opinion, these are actually even more prominent and were even more uh, at fault as to why fascism was able to rise later on. In all honesty, the very creation of the Italian political system was already an utter mess, given that it was not based on any pre-established parliamentary formats or a two-party state. Italy had no political parties whatsoever, and if anyone wanted to run for the national elections, they actually had to put themselves forward as independent candidates. And because of the lack of political party uh, parties, what actually ended up happening is that these independent candidates were forced into forming factions in which they would form a, con a conglomerate along other independent candidates and run for office. And then when in power, they would share the positions in government. And as you can expect, this already led to some great uh, weaknesses in itself given that people were often not qualified to the positions that they were put in and so on. However, the major problem with the lack of political parties in Italy and the development of these factions is that they cultivated and decided the policy of transformismo. Uh, in essence, transformismo was this practice in which independent politicians would put their differences aside, even if they were supposed ideological enemies, to form factions and run for government. And as you can probably see, this was very, very detrimental for the Italian government, for the Italian state, and for the Italian people. Because when in government, the different agendas of these politicians would quickly come through, with each of them trying to accomplish different things in government that were often contradicting and opposing, which made the government very ineffective, inefficient, and quick standing as well, as these fragile coalitions often fell very quickly, and governments were forced to be renewed and replenished by the minute, essentially. But also, besides this, there were some other major political weaknesses as well, such as the fact that very few people in Italy actually had the power to vote, with the majority of the urban and rural population not having a say on who their representatives were going to be whatsoever. Similarly, political candidates came from very similar backgrounds, often being wealthy or middle-class men which was very detrimental to the government given that there was often no diverging opinions or no diverging ideas uh, and there was generally a lack of diversity in government as well. When we zoom in at very specific points in Italian history, we can truly see how these political weaknesses really shine through, making Italy seem like a very weak nation. For example, between 1870 and 1922, Italy had around 29 prime ministers, which truly exposed how fragile governments were and how frequently they were falling, given that the leader of the country was changing very, very frequently. Just a quick historiography for you guys, many historians have looked at liberal politics uh, in Italy and seen how these ever-changing governments uh, were suggestions that liberal politics were act was actually about the pursuit of power rather than the good of the nation, given that these politicians would quickly ascend to a position of power, uh, stay for a little while, gain some money, gain some prestige, but quickly give it to the next person who was equally as unqualified so they could do this very next thing. And meanwhile, the Italian government did nothing uh, at all to improve the situation of the Italian people and improve the development of the Italian nation, which was still very primitive in comparison to the rest of Europe. All right, guys, so this about wraps up the political weaknesses of liberal Italy, which together with everything that we've discussed so far, compiled the major weaknesses of liberal Italy as a whole. And it's gonna be extremely important that you keep all of these reasons in mind throughout the remainder of this video and also our future videos on Mussolini's rise to power, because all of these uh, weaknesses are like the backbone as to why liberal Italy fell and Mussolini was able to rise as a dictator in Italy with a fascist regime. Uh, in our next video, when we continue discussing liberal Italy, uh, we're going to be talking about the stability of liberal Italy and what was uh, positive about its stability and what proved uh, or exposed that it was actually a weak country. And you're going to see that all of these weaknesses are going to be shining through once again, but in a more uh, applied sort of way, are we gonna, as we're going to be looking at specific points in Italian politics that display signs of economic weaknesses, uh, the lack of an Italian identity, polit political weaknesses, the hostility of the church, 
and so on. But all of these ideas are gonna be further explored towards our next video. As of now, however, let's wrap up this video by talking about the major threats to liberal Italy, which besides the general weaknesses that it possessed because of the political economic system that was already put in place, there were some specific groups of people that posed some significant threats to, the, uh, to liberal Italy's survival. So just before we end up the video, let's go on to discuss a couple of these groups. Uh, which are also going to be very important and you guys should keep in mind when we carry out um, this series on Mussolini's Rise as they are also going to be coming up in the next couple of videos. So let's get started with those. So guys, the first threat that we're going to be discussing is actually something that many other nations also saw as a threat throughout the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century as well. And this was, of course, socialism. The rise of socialism in Italy actually started off in the 1880s when the industrialization that was going on in the north of the country started to generate and produce a pretty sizable working class out of the necessity of the factories, industries, and so on. And by 1881, it became extremely clear that socialism was going to be a very prominent ideology and the socialists a very prominent group in Italian politics, given that a government reform granted around 2 million Italians of the working class the power to vote, which of course would use this opportunity to attempt to insert socialism in the Italian political system. However, as socialism became an increasingly popular ideology amongst the Italian working class, uh, two very distinct groups that followed this same ideology started to emerge. The first was a more moderate group of socialists that truly only advocated for policies such as an eight-hour working day, paid vacations, workers' laws, a safer work environment, and so on. Yet the other was a much more radical group of socialists that truly wanted to incite a communist revolution in Italy. The former, however, the more moderate group, went on to create the PSI, which was the Italian Socialist Party, uh, created in 1895, whereas the other group uh, increasingly became dialed down as a group of radicals that really did not gain much traction amongst the Italian population. But even if this group of radical socialists did not gain much traction, it became clear following the creation of the PSI in 1895 that socialism, at least in its moderate form, was going to gain a lot of traction in the nation, given that only 10 years after the creation of the PSI, the party had already secured uh, somewhat of a 200,000 votes and around 32 seats in the Chamber of Deputies, which was the Italian Parliament. Like I said, even though the PSI was overwhelmingly made up of moderate socialists that only advocated for causes such as income taxes, universal manhood suffrage, women's rights, and so on, socialism still sparked fear all across Italy. Uh, the PSI was indeed successful in securing a significant amount of votes and seats in 1905, but in comparison to other groups, ideologies, and now emerging parties in Italy, in the 1900s or the early 1900s, it was still fairly a fairly small party, but it was already inciting fear and sparking uh, tensions and hostilities among some other conservative, conservative and more traditional groups in Italy, such as the very Catholic Church. Which leads us to the next threat that we're going to be talking about, which is of course Catholicism. Uh, in the beginning of the video, we referenced some of the early hostilities between the Catholic Church and the Italian uh, state. But now let's go a little bit more in depth about how this, these tensions developed over the years, especially following the rise of socialism, which truly changed the status quo in terms of the relations between the church and the Italian state. Uh, in all, although hostilities remained between uh, the church and the Italian state throughout most of the 1900s, in 1805, following the creation of the PSI, the Pope finally lifted the ban on Catholic participation in the Italian political system. And this was mainly because both the church and the Italian state sought socialism as a common enemy. And it was in the hopes of the Pope that by allowing Catholics to vote uh, in the elections to parties that were against socialism, then uh, together with the Italian state, the church could um, eliminate or at least repress this imminent threat that was uh, rising exponentially. However, like I said before, tensions between the state and the church still remained. So much so that the Pope refused to allow the creation of a Catholic party to participate in the political system, something that would only occur years uh, down the line. Although what is interesting to notice is that the Pope did allow some Catholics to put themselves uh, forward as independent candidates, hoping that this would at least bring some Catholic policies to the Italian government. 
Yet this was no sea of flowers for the liberals after all, because even though Catholicism and liberalism were very much in line that socialism was a negative thing, they were at odds with equally as many clauses, which meant that the liberals had yet another uh, imminent threat coming underway. And lastly, the final threat that we're going to be discussing is perhaps the first indication that a right-wing fascist state was soon on the horizon for Italy, as this was of course the threat of the nationalists uh, in Italy. Being very honest, the nationalists were quite a small group of people in Italy at that time. However, they were a loud bunch, having a lot of friends in the media uh, and press that printed their ideas and divulged them all across the nation, making them seem uh, bigger than they actually were. They were vastly critical of liberal politicians claiming that they were only in politics in pursuit of power, uh, power rather than um, truly wanting the good of the nation. And they were vastly critical of their policies as well, uh, mainly criticizing the fact that, uh, that these politicians had not made Italy as strong as Britain or France, which at that time were two of the major nations in Europe. And because they were very upset that Italy was not as strong as Britain and France, they would greatly advocate towards a greater military spending in Italy, with the hopes that this would allow for a more uh, assertive and a stronger foreign policy that would allow for the expansion of the Italian Empire into Africa and the Mediterranean, which would allow the Italian Empire to grow uh, to the same status as that of Britain and France, which was a great empire at that time. And as you can see by these expansionist desires, the nationalists were indeed going to be the ones who would call for Italy's entrance into the First World War, believing that this would allow the country to emerge as a major global uh, superpower in Europe, of course. And naturally, they were also going to, be the one, going to be the ones who would help the rise of fascism with Mussolini as their leader. All right, guys, so this brings us to the end of our first video on Mussolini's rise to power and the Italy topic on the IB history syllabus. I truly hope that you've enjoyed this video so far um, and all the ideas that are proposed. Um, if it was a little bit confusing, that makes perfect sense to me because it is a different format than how we did it in Germany. Uh, so what I would highly encourage you guys to do is watch this video in parallel to the notes that I've provided on the actual document that's linked down below. So you can see exactly what format I'm following and you can see that everything is uh, linked through very nicely. Um, again, I highly encourage you to watch next week's video as well where we're going to be talking about the stability of liberal Italy because a lot of the ideas that we're talking about here, the threats and the weaknesses are going to be uh, very much linked to the stability video later on but in a much more applied uh, way, given that we're going to be looking at specific events that show the economic weaknesses, political weaknesses, and how these um, threats by specific groups uh, really came through. All right, guys, with that said, I'm going to wrap up the video right here. As always, make use of these notes that I've provided because they're my personal IB notes that I used and they are really of great help. Uh, you can find the full document linked down below uh, where I show, where you can see all the tables really organized and um, it's really, if you're a visual person like myself, you really benefit from seeing the tables and seeing the color codes and everything else. Uh, besides that, please follow me on my Instagram at IBWithIn, as it always shows up in the end of the video, because there I make frequent posts on uh, future videos that are coming up, video summaries, thumbnails, and everything else that you might need to keep up with the content that I'm providing in this channel every every week, along with Lara, of course, my beautiful editor. So yeah, guys, you can always, also always contact me whenever you want, asking me questions, doubts, or concerns via Instagram and direct messages. Uh, email or even asking questions down in the comments. I'm always responding to those as well and I love to do so. So please don't be shy to reach out or say anything you want to say. With that said guys, I'll see you guys um, next week or next Friday. I think this video is coming up on Tuesday. I'll see you guys on Friday with a video on uh, liberal Italy stability. Be there, you need it, and you'll be good. Um, so yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.